Song at Midnight is one of the most unique Chinese films of the 1930s, a horror musical. The film had a spectacular opening in 1937, on the eve of war with Japan. It took place at Shanghai's Lyrical Theater, and over the theater loomed this larger-than-life image of a grotesque phantom singer, with green light bulbs in the place of his eyes. The press got in on the hype, claiming that the ad had frightened a child to death, and it advised moviegoers to leave their children at home. Song at Midnight promised not just a good story with romance, drama, and pathos, but also a thrilling and chilling sensory experience with gothic horror, hair-raising suspense, and, as its title suggests, music. The film was so successful that in 1941, director Ma Xu Wei Bang shot a sequel, which unfortunately does not survive, and no fewer than five films entitled Song at Midnight were made in Hong Kong and in China between 1956 and 1995. We also have a 2005 TV drama and a 2018 musical film. In this video of Chinese film classics, we'll review the plot of Song at Midnight and examine how the film builds suspense leading up to the unveiling of the monstrous phantom. We'll also take a look at how it creates a unique genre mix of song, history, and monstrosity. In the next video, we'll focus on what you could call the politics of horror including this film's multiple climaxes featuring sensational revelations. We'll also talk about how the film could be read as something of a political allegory. Song at Midnight was a sensation in 1937, in part for its lurid makeup and spooky nocturnal atmospherics, which drew on a long history of cinematic horror dating back to the 1922 German film Nosferatu. Ma Xu Weibang had previously directed and even starred in films about strange, bizarre, or uncanny creatures these guairin, including The Strange Lover, Qing Chang Guairin from 1926, and The Stranger of Dark Night, Hei Ye Guairin from 1928. Ma Xu drew inspiration from German Expressionist cinema and from Hollywood films such as The Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1923 and 1925's Phantom of the Opera. Hunchback and Phantom both starred an actor called Lon Chaney, known as the Man of a Thousand Faces, as their scary title character. Chinese advertisements for Song at Midnight even presented Ma Xu as Cheney's Chinese counterpart, a master of grotesque transformation. Let's briefly review the plot of the film, which offers spectacle, song, and a story of romantic and revolutionary resurrection. One stormy night in 1926, the Angel Theatrical Troupe arrives at an abandoned theater to begin rehearsals for a series of local performances. Sun Xiaoo, the male lead in a new musical, is having trouble learning his lines for its theme song, Romance of the Yellow River, and he rehearses on stage alone. Suddenly a shadow looms up and a powerful voice begins singing the lines to him. The ancient caretaker of the theater indicates to Xiao O that the voice belongs to Song Danping, a famous actor who for a decade has been thought to be dead. Though initially spooked by the disembodied voice, Xiao O realizes that it is teaching him his part. Xiao O learns the song well, and the show triumphs. He goes backstage to thank his unseen benefactor afterwards, and follows the voice up a stairwell to a tower room. There, Xiao O encounters a hooded figure who tells him his story. Back in 1913, he was a revolutionary named Jin Zijin, who in 1916 was forced to assume a new identity, and he reinvented himself as the actor Song Danping. Flashbacks show that Dan Ping was in love with a young woman named Li Xiaoxia, or Xia for short, but that her gentry father listened to the slander of Dan Ping's rival, Tang Jun, and had him tortured. When Xia rejected Tang, Tang had his henchmen throw acid on Dan Ping's face. Dan Ping survives, but the bandages come off to reveal that his face has been hideously scarred. Filled with rage and self loathing, Dan Ping has Xia informed that he is dead, and this news drives her insane. Since then, he has been singing his song at midnight to Xia, lamenting their separation and suffering. With the arrival of Xiao O, Dan Ping feels new hope for the political cause and the woman he has hidden himself from for so long. Song Dan Ping once composed and sang a song of hot-blooded or Xue revolution. Now, Sun Xiao O sings Dan Ping's new version of the same song, again to thunderous acclaim. But Tang Jun, who owns the theater, has now set his sights on Xiao O's girlfriend, Lu Die. One night, Tang attacks her in the dressing room, and when Xiao O arrives, 
Tang aims for him and ends up shooting her. Dan Ping emerges from the shadows to confront his old nemesis, and the Phantom and Tang fight their way up to the tower room. Tang plunges out of a window to his death, and Dan Ping swings on a rope down to the stage. Xiao O then returns to the stage to plead for calm, but the audience runs off in pursuit of this monstrous apparition. Out on the streets, the audience turns into a torch-wielding mob, which chases Dan Ping to an abandoned tower and sets it alight. Just as the burning Dan Ping leaps to his death in the river, Xia, back at home, suddenly regains both her sanity and her memory. Xiao O promises her that they will realize Dan Ping's hopes in the future, and the two of them stand together and gaze out at the rising dawn. Let's now return to the first few minutes of the film, which immediately establish a spooky ambiance. A shot of the moon against the sky dissolves into a long shot of an abandoned theater. The bombastic soundtrack gives way to a lulling harp, and the camera draws close to a public notice dated August 1926, stating that this theater is slated to be demolished. A cat darts through the shadows, and then abruptly an enormous hand reaches out of the shadows, and a long shot reveals that it belongs to a grotesque and somewhat sinister looking figure who emerges from the doorway holding aloft a lantern that shines on his haggard features and long fingernails. The next shot of a triangular shadow moving across the wall is more ambiguous. Is it this old man's or is it somebody else's? A jarring cut then confronts us with the face of another man in medium close-up, lit from below, leering at the camera. The first old man, the theater caretaker, arrives and produces from his pocket a letter stating that the Angel Theatrical Troupe is scheduled to arrive that night. A gust of wind then blows out a lantern and the scene ends. Like in Yuan Muzhi's film Street Angels, which was also released in 1937, the first song in Song at Midnight begins just a few moments into the film. But unlike Street Angels, we don't actually see the singer. The shadow of a cloaked hooded figure looms in front of a decrepit wall and a deep voice begins to sing as lyrics appear at the bottom of the screen. We hear a song of a lonely man wandering and singing in the night. An abrupt cut then interrupts the song. A night watchman walks by with a lantern, banging on a gong. The song then resumes and another apparition appears. A young woman clad in ghostly white with a candle-bearing, hunchbacked old woman at her side. She walks forward towards the windows as if in response to the singer's question, who will wait with me until the dawn? In this opening song, the mysterious singer addresses the young woman with metaphors of their shared solitude. She is the moon, he is a cold star nearby. She is a tree on the hill, he a withered branch. The phantom refers to himself as being more hideous than a ghost, but he asserts that he is determined to speak aloud for injustice. If he's a ghost, he's not just an object, but a subject with a voice. He sings, I would be that castrated historian, writing down all of the injustices of the world. And in doing so, he's likening himself to China's most celebrated historian, Sima Qian, who wrote the records of the Grand Historian, or Shi Ji, after having been castrated for an alleged political crime. So the ghost seems to be suggesting that he too is a martyr. His song at midnight climaxes with his expression of a desire and rage that storms and billows like the waves. Scholar David Derwei Wang once wrote that modern Chinese literature has been haunted by what he called the monster that is history, in the form of repeated cycles of trauma, suffering, violence, and cruelty. Song at Midnight, too, dramatizes a story of repetitive harm done to the revolutionary cause. This is a cause personified by two young men. The phantom represents, you could say, the repressed history of monstrosity, confined to the attic and awaiting its chance to reemerge. The phantom's role as a storyteller also calls to mind, for me at least, another historian, Pu Songling, the author of China's most famous collection of ghost stories, Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio, or Liao Jai Zhi from 1740. Pu Songling called himself the historian of the strange, and Song Danping might be considered a strange historian himself two times over. He both sings and speaks of strange events, and he himself is a somewhat unusual being. Yet this strange historian is later revealed to be more than a mere teller of tales, 
as he even uses his own maimed body to protect the next generation from being victimized as he was. Song at Midnight establishes a strong acoustic theme early on, with its title song, a busy orchestral soundtrack, and extensive use of atmospheric sound effects to simulate wind, rain, and thunder. The scene of the Angel Troop's arrival at the theater, for example, is accompanied by a cascade of violins. Despite the storm, the scene is pretty jolly with a hubbub of excited voices. The group's entrance into the theater interior, in contrast, takes place in a suspenseful silence. The old caretaker, who is really the foremost in a cast of picturesque supporting characters, with his long flowing hair, his long whiskers, his exaggerated limp, and his long fingernails, he clutches his lantern and leads this crowd down a dark passageway. And for over a minute of screen time, they remain silent, the only sound coming from the shuffling footsteps and the sound of the wind outside. When they reach the stage, a plucked string twangs as a snake falls from the cobwebs. Mice skitter across the floor, and with another twang, the crowd looks up to see a pair of corpses hanging in midair. An actress screams, but it's just a pair of dummies. The next day, the troupe leader announces that they will be rehearsing a new operetta of the Romance of the Yellow River, Huang He Zhilian, which is set in the Song Dynasty and concerns lovers on opposite sides of the Yellow River, a waiting woman named Treasure and a man who sings of being like a little bird who cannot return to its nest. The theme of this play within a play returns at the end of the film, which features a watery death. We then have the first contact between the young hero and the phantom. Xiao O is trying to learn his lines for Romance of the Yellow River alone on stage, and when he hears the voice singing the lines to him, he realizes that it's trying to help him, and he and Song Danping begin a duet. The first musical number in the film, Song at Midnight, had already established Dan Ping's voice as something of a controlling force. When he sings of rain or of waves, they appear before our eyes. Now, the disembodied voice controls the direction of the story itself. We then jump forward, and a brief scene on the stage shows Xiao O triumphing in the role. He then returns backstage to thank his mentor, following his voice up a set of stairs into a tower room where he encounters the hooded figure. A discordant crash of piano wires conveys his shock and horror at the dark, mysterious, faceless figure who turns around, picks up a candle, and walks over to examine his face. Don't be afraid, he says. I am human. I'm the same as you, a man with blood, flesh, and soul. And with pent-up urgency, he starts to unburden himself of his story. He says that he is indeed the famous actor Song Danping, which was the alias of a revolutionary known 13 years ago as Jin Zijin. This moment of encounter not only matches the voice with a body, but also intertwines spectacle and narrative. The truth of the mysterious phantom is revealed step by step, with both the unfolding of a backstory and the unveiling of scars taking place in stages with increasing suspense. Dan Ping shows Xiao O a photo of himself from 13 years ago, 1913, and we see a young man then furiously galloping to escape from some unknown pursuer. And now here is where the film brings together horror and history. The year 1913 was two years following the Republican Revolution, which toppled the Qing Dynasty and founded the Republic of China. However, the Republic was weak. It was led by a straw man called Yuan Shikai, who had muscled his way into the presidency and in 1916 even attempted to make himself emperor. But Yuan's ambitions were already apparent back in 1913, when several provinces opposed to Yuan's abuses of power attempted to overthrow him in what became known as the Second Republican Revolution. So Jin Zijian, aka Song Danping, we learn, was a member of the Revolutionary Party, the Kuomintang, and thus he was likely a participant in the Second Revolution. Now, Sun Xiaoo arrived at the theater in the year 1926, when China was still in the throes of the so-called warlord era. It was actually only in 1928 that most of the northern warlords would be suppressed, leading to a decade of relative political stability. In 1926, however, things are still looking dark for China. A new dawn is a distant hope, and revolutionaries are still figuratively singing a song at midnight. 
So at this moment in the film, Xiao'o demands to see this mysterious figure's face, but the phantom is not ready yet. He then tells the next part of his story about how in 1916 he went undercover as an actor and performed the play Hot-Blooded, Ru Xue, of his own composition, which dramatizes the passion of socially progressive youths. A flashback shows us the dashing young man singing on stage again to thunderous acclaim. But after the show, Dan Ping's love Xia warns him that his rival and her father plan to harm him. They part and sure enough, a gang of toughs immediately captures him and strips him down to be tortured. The torture scene that follows exemplifies this film's theme of hidden suffering and visible scars, and its emphasis on spectatorship of suffering rather than on the process of victimization. Instead of seeing Song Danping being whipped, we see the onlookers, including Xia and her father. As in other scenes, the focus is on the witnesses and perpetrators of atrocity. Immediately after the whipping, Xia condemns Danping's rival Tang Jun, and he retaliates by having his men accost Danping and throw nitric acid on his face. A weapon, incidentally, which was also used in a 1931 film called The Singing Beauty, Yu Mei Ren. We next see Dan Ping at the home of his troop leader, Mr. Zhong, who is accompanied by his wife and young daughter. His head and hands are swathed in bandages. But the doctor advises that Dan Ping should be able to recover within a week. Mr. Zhong tells Dan Ping that they preserve the bottle as evidence against Tang Jun, but Dan Ping is reluctant to prosecute because he wants to protect his woman. The scene that follows of Dan Ping's so-called recovery day is a masterpiece of suspense and melodrama. But we'll have to wait to see what happens in the next video.